Jane Smith gave John Smith face at the shooting range when she missed a shot, but John Smith did not indulge her. Picking up a toy gun, he hit target after target, not forgetting to show off in the process. Beginner's luck. John Smith won a prize and gave it to Jane Smith, who then wanted to play again. And this time... Everybody's a winner! Win a prize, win a prize! <laughs> Where'd you learn to shoot like Beginner's luck. Their story began in Colombia. Amidst the assassination of a mafia boss, the police surrounded the hotel, and to solve the case quickly, they only searched solo travelers. As John Smith reached behind him, the solo Jane Smith walked into the lobby, swiftly sheathing her dagger. John Smith's gaze shifted to see the solo girl about to be searched. Their eyes met amidst a flash of lightning, a perfect match. They sheathed their would-be drawn weapons and embraced, leaving the hotel together. They didn't know each other's professions, but they had miraculously survived death together. After three rounds of drinks, Jane Smith threw away her cup, and like a spark to a flame, neither wanted to go home. They danced together, and despite the pouring rain, they continued to drink under the shelter. The next morning, Jane Smith woke up in a strange place, only to find that the stranger from last night had prepared a delicious breakfast. Love at first sight wasn't about liking someone from just one look, but after that look, they were already deeply hidden in each other's hearts. They were ready to get married. John Smith's friend didn't understand. They had only known each other for six months. When Jane Smith told her friends about the marriage, they thought it was too fast. She knew John Smith as a contractor, and John Smith knew Jane Smith as a computer engineer, unaware of each other's real professions. Their friends thought they would last at most half a year, but in the blink of an eye, about five or six years passed. A package was thrown at John Smith's doorstep. They had lived a happy life for five or six years, but now life was mundane. Lacking the passion of their early marriage, they would argue over trivial matters. Every morning at 7 o'clock, they left the house together. Even the path by their door could spark a conflict. Every evening, Jane Smith would arrive home first and, as usual, cook a table full of dishes. John Smith would reverse the car into the garage and then put on his wedding ring. They seemed very loving, but underlying tensions continually emerged. Jane Smith mentioned she bought new curtains, but John Smith only responded perfunctorily. John Smith would show off his ball skills on the way to take out the trash in the rain. Jane Smith was the same. When John Smith wasn't around, she moved as if she could leap across rooftops. At night, they would each read the newspaper in bed, gradually talking less and less, yet both harboring their own secrets. One day, Jane Smith donned a black trench coat, having to go out for work. John Smith reminded her they were invited to the neighbors for dinner, and Jane Smith assured him she wouldn't be late. John Smith also had something to attend to. Jane Smith got out of the car at a hotel, while John Smith headed to a bar. Jane Smith was escorted by bodyguards to a luxurious room, and John Smith made his way to the casino inside the bar. He pushed open a door where a game was one player short. The three men intended to send him away, claiming the spot was taken. But John Smith insisted on playing. One of them flashed a gun, and then John Smith showed his money, indicating he could afford to play. Jane Smith went a bit too far this time, visiting Marco Rayson and undressing her trench coat in front of him removing her hairpin, and letting down her seductive hair. John Smith blended into the gambling scene, enjoying himself immensely because he was losing happily. Right when the person who was supposed to be playing cards arrived, this reveals John Smith's true identity, the top assassin for an assassin company. Meanwhile, his beloved wife was in the same room with Marco Rayson, who, though tied up, appeared to be in ecstasy. Jane Smith is also an assassin, but she and John Smith are in opposing companies, dressed in her black trench coat. She made her escape just as she was about to be discovered, her backpack hanging from a metal lampstand, then dashing out of the building and leaping from the high-rise. She landed next to a taxi, adjusted her hairstyle, and headed home, dressed to the nines. They attended the neighbor's party, where the men talked business and the women discussed men, like how one woman's husband got promoted and asked Jane Smith to help take care of the children, but she seemed not quite cut out for it. John Smith went to the garage, opening the hidden basement that served as his secret base. This was the Rael John Smith. Surrounded by various weapons and piles of cash, he packed a box of items. He had a trip to make. As John Smith left the room, Jane Smith also sprang into action, wondering why she had been cooking all these years. It turns out the kitchen hid mechanisms. The dishwasher was not just a dishwasher but also her secret arsenal, stocked with pistols and daggers. The surface appeared to be John Smith's office, but there was another secret here. Two screens slowly rose, revealing his new mission. Benjamin Dans, held by military intelligence was to be transferred to a federal prison across the border, and John Smith was tasked with eliminating him there. On Jane Smith's end, her company's environment was much more upscale. She wasn't alone. A bunch of subordinates worked for her, 
and her target was also Benjamin Dan's. To keep the plan secret, there was only one attack point, meaning only one chance to strike. As Benjamin Dan's was being escorted, Jane Smith was ready at the shooting position. Just then, a man appeared in the deserted wasteland. Jane Smith raises her binoculars to check. The man bumps into Jane Smith's infrared gear, and Jane Smith, fearing that her plans have been disrupted, raises her binoculars once more. She saw the man, in a pose that resembled someone she knew well, and as the target was about to arrive, the man shouldered the bazooka. Jane Smith immediately brought up her rifle and Jane Smith was ready to start, moving when the man slowly stood up and looked angrily at the cabin halfway up the hill. Then, a bomb planned by Jane Smith exploded at the wrong time. Foiling both teams' plans, Jane Smith decided that fleeing on a motorcycle was the best option. While John Smith found only the remains of a computer in the cabin, both missions failed, and they returned to their respective companies to report. Tracking the computer's dealer led John to Jane's workplace. The recipient was his wife, leaving John bewildered. At this time, Jane Smith in the office looked at that opponent very familiar. His posture and that dashing look. My God, this is not my husband. John Smith put on his wedding ring and quietly returned home. He couldn't believe that his wife of six years was an assassin. Jane Smith thought the same thing. It turned out that her husband was his own counterparts. John dared not drink the wine served by Jane, secretly disposing of it. If they were truly from rival companies, elimination was the only option. The wife went to the kitchen. John Smith looked nervous, picked up a dinner knife, then smiled, looking at the sharp knife. John Smith got up. The result is that he is going to cut the steak himself. But I did not expect Jane Smith from the body to draw another. The tension until both sides will be put down the dinner knife. They were talking about work, and Jane Smith said that someone was stealing their clients, and it was none other than John Smith? John Smith picked up the wine bottle and poured his wife a full glass of fine wine. Then with a flourish, Jane Smith sensed something was amiss, letting go. The red wine spilled onto the carpet. They both grabbed towels and left the dining room, making the situation quite obvious. They were all far from ordinary, claiming to fetch towels. John Smith instead picked up a handgun. While Jane Smith had already sped away in her car, John Smith quickly followed. Though they were assassins on opposing sides, they were also a couple married for six years. If they really had to kill each other, it wouldn't be easy, for they were in love. However, an anxious John Smith accidentally fired a bullet, hitting his wife's windshield. Now, he had no chance to explain. Jane Smith drove straight at him, intending to clarify, but it was too late for words. John Smith jumped into the car, then Jane Smith leaped out. We need to talk! John Smith sought solace with a friend, who always believed women were untrustworthy. Jane Smith turned to her colleague, who thought she should not hesitate to kill him, given she profession as an assassin. That night, they were both in agony. John Smith lay in his friend's bed, unable to sleep. The next morning, Jane Smith, along with her team, turned their house upside down. She felt mixed emotions as she watched a colleague tear up her doll and looked at her wedding photos before driving them away. John Smith didn't go straight home but called over his neighbor who had always wanted to visit. Not knowing he was now John Smith's shield, John Smith went to his garage and into the known basement, finding all his guns, ammunition, and assets gone. The couple's showdown had officially begun. Jane Smith had her subordinates dig into John Smith's background, but at that moment, John Smith arrived at her company's building. Be careful, I could take you out anytime, anywhere, and you wouldn't find me even with a map, she warned. As they spoke, intruders reached the rooftop, forcing them to initiate their retreat plan. The women blew up documents, deleted hard drives and systems, and equipped their escape gear, then blew up one window after another. Several spears were fired at the building opposite, and they ziplined down, while John Smith approached through a secret passage. As Jane Smith was about to leave, John Smith reached her secret office location, but he was too late. Jane Smith had already reached the rooftop opposite. John Smith had the chance to take out Jane Smith but chose not to, through the destroyed site. John Smith quickly traced a real estate company he suspected Jane Smith was using as her office. John Smith got into the elevator, which then malfunctioned. He knew Jane Smith had set a trap for him. Jane Smith had John Smith trapped in the elevator, hanging 70 floors high. But John Smith was defiant. Do you know what I'm capable of? He told Jane Smith. She offered him a chance to leave, or she would detonate the bomb. As they were speaking, the underling pressed the detonator, and the elevator instantly exploded turning the surveillance feed to black and white. The elevator was in free fall, then exploded violently upon hitting the ground. Jane Smith rushed out of their office, her husband of six years presumably dead. At that moment, John Smith felt a chill in his heart, pondering deeply. If his wife truly intended to kill him, 
It was a good thing he was prepared by disabling the surveillance on the exploding elevator and hiding in a different one. But Jane Smith wasn't having an easy time either. She went to the restaurant where John Smith had proposed to her, tears streaming down her face. Just then, a gentleman appeared and poured her a drink. She knew it had to be John Smith. This time it wasn't for a proposal, but for a divorce. They began to speak honestly, each sticking to their own, unable to do anything about the situation. John Smith invited Jane Smith to dance. As they danced, they talked and sought revenge. John Smith disarmed Jane Smith of her cold weapon. Then as Jane Smith knelt down, John Smith revealed a wicked smile. Realizing Jane Smith was disarming him, they talk about marriage, about betrayal, and Jane Smith wants to go to the bathroom. But John Smith knows that it's never that simple. Jane Smith ran out of the women's restroom, which then exploded. Just as John Smith had suspected, the scene instantly turned chaotic, and Jane Smith took the opportunity to slip away. John Smith chased her outside the restaurant, where an old man who had admired him reminded him, Did you bring a clock out with you? John Smith then realized a timed bomb had been placed in his clothes. If it came to ruthlessness, women were indeed formidable. John Smith stole a car and called Jane Smith, who had already tried to kill him twice. But as he prepared to end it all, John Smith reminisced about their first meeting. Feeling Jane Smith was like Christmas morning. Jane Smith's heart was also breaking. She said John Smith was the most handsome target she had ever seen. They were about to return home. Ready to settle things once and for all, John Smith drove up to the house, followed by Jane Smith crashing into him. Jane Smith raced to the garage first, with John Smith getting out of the car on the road and running towards his luxurious mansion. John Smith was a step behind compared to Jane Smith, who was already prepared, waiting for him to burst in. John Smith climbed to the third floor, finding the house's decorative toy guns, which turned out to be real guns. He then attached a silencer and began his move. While Jane Smith mercilessly aimed her spray at the staircase, the couple engaged in a fierce stairway battle. John Smith stylishly reloaded. Jane Smith charged down the stairs, and in a narrow confrontation, bullets miraculously missed their targets. This time, Jane Smith, wielding dual guns, looked powerful as she watched both sides. They destroyed the kitchen, the fridge, and their cozy home. What grievance was so large that a couple would fight like this? Catching her off guard, the white shot the gas cylinder John Smith had disassembled setting the kitchen on fire. They began to fight in close quarters, hitting each other hard into each other's bodies. John Smith threw Jane Smith to one side, and Jane Smith picked up a large iron pan, never the minor character. The close combat became even closer. With Jane Smith landing punch after punch, she was grabbed by the hair, followed by John Smith's fierce kicks, showing no mercy. In the end, they both picked up each other's guns, but neither could bring themselves to shoot. John Smith was the first to put down the gun. He couldn't do it. Neither of them could go on, choosing instead to love more passionately. Their bosses had ordered them to eliminate each other within 48 hours. But John Smith and Jane Smith couldn't bring themselves to do it. Not only did they not take out each other, but it seemed they were becoming happier. Drinking juice from a half-broken glass, having breakfast on the only clean spot left, they were honest with each other once again. This time, they were not prepared to kill each other. But someone couldn't agree with that their bosses, since they hadn't eliminated the assassin from the rival company. Both of them needed to die. A smoke grenade was thrown into the room. John Smith took Jane Smith to the basement, unwilling to harm each other. They decided to face the external threat together. As a robot entered, signaling an imminent explosion meant to take them both out by leveling the villa. They managed to escape just in time. Part of their enemies were instantly engulfed by the flames, not knowing whose bomb had been set, making the other side's people accompany them in death. Fortunately, the Smith couple rushed out of the blast zone. They crawled out from under a plank. Looking at their destroyed home with mixed feelings, it was time to turn against those above them. They found a car at their neighbor's and hit the road, bumping into a minor character. John Smith took his gun and magazine, with three cars closely following. They knew it had started again. Jane Smith moved to the back seat to open the trunk, and due to the excessive shaking, she and John Smith decided to switch roles, indeed making things more harmonious. The enemy's car had bulletproof glass. John Smith mentioned he had been married once prompting Jane Smith to slam on the brakes a matter that absolutely could not be forgiven. The man climbed out of the sunroof. John Smith picked up a golf club, pulled the pin from his grenade, and urged his wife to speed up, taking care of the car just like that. Another assassin underestimated them, wanting a duel with John Smith but ended up going in one door and out another. Jane Smith told John Smith that her parents had died when she was five, and the parents at their wedding were actors she had hired. Two more cars continued to follow closely. Jane Smith swerved causing the van to drift and turn around. Then, taking up her handgun, she took out the second and third cars, eliminating two enemy vehicles just like that. John Smith had underestimated her. After the Kong, 
They continued talking. John Smith had actually invited his real parents to the wedding. John Smith met with his friend, who thought he had taken out Jane Smith, but it seemed not to be the case, seeing the couple quite affectionate. The friend suggested they split up and run since both assassin companies were after them. Separating might give them a chance to survive, albeit a slim one. Jane Smith called her friend. They decided to start with their last mutual target, Benjamin Dans, now under high alert. The couple, joining forces, had John Smith continue through the pipes, with Jane Smith directing from the outside, seemingly not very difficult. After taking out the guards, they easily abducted Benjamin Dans. They rented a room to interrogate him harshly, wanting to know why both their companies wanted Benjamin Dans dead. But when it came to interrogation, John Smith seemed a bit lacking, while Jane Smith was blunt and violent. Benjamin Dans had a letter on him, revealing he wasn't the target but a bait. Both companies knew they were married and set them up against each other because a family of two rivals was deemed harmful. Both companies had one goal, to have their agents kill the other. However, they hadn't done so and thus had to be killed together. John Smith pulled out Benjamin Dans's belt. The enemy was two minutes away. With helicopters and luxury off-road vehicles, dozens of fully equipped squads stormed into the hotel. They only saw the bait. Benjamin Dans, but not a trace of the Smiths. They guessed the couple had run away, not expecting them to be in the most dangerous place. Jane Smith thought their chances of survival would be greater if they split up. John Smith felt that running would mean running for a lifetime. Better to stay and fight together, facing reality to solve everything. Jane Smith agreed. It seemed the man's word prevailed. They sneaked into a mall but were spotted by the enemy's drones. They quickly geared up, and the enemy arrived soon after, bracing for a big battle. They donned model suits and night vision goggles. Several enemies had infiltrated the mall, trying not to draw attention, meaning no noise. Then, with more equipment, as a group of enemies approached, Jane Smith whirled her throwing knives, nearly all fatal, with a few intentionally missed. Finally, gunfire erupted. They rushed into an elevator, ready for what came next. But the next floor seemed even more dangerous. Jane Smith apologized for the knife incident, but John Smith didn't want to talk. They exited the elevator on another floor with John Smith charging ahead and Jane Smith sniping from a high point. Until Jane Smith was spotted, John Smith's face turned red. He wouldn't allow his wife to be shot at. They readied their weapons and burst through the door for the final showdown. Back to back, they dodged bullets and grenades, then stood up to fight furiously. They stood face to face, extended their arms, then turned to stand back to back. Bullets and explosions missed them by inches, but they hit one enemy after another. The enemy seemed less like foes and more like the many difficulties of life. In the end, only the two of them remained. Victorious. Afterward, they redecorated their house, finding back the passion in life, and continued to live happily ever after. I'm a movie enthusiast. Subscribe to my channel for more. And see you next time.